Thing last time. So remember that we talked about displacement gradient, and because it's a tensor, we can write it as a summation of a symmetric and a skew symmetric part. And we called those E and omega last time, just that um, you remember what we were doing. And the rest, we try to see um, what are the meanings of these two components. So we consider this trivial case of both of them be zero, which is just simply translation. And then we were in the middle of the second case, or no, not in the middle, towards the end, um, where E is equal to zero. Now we haven't given anything, any names yet, right? E is equal to zero, and omega isn't. So um, if you remember, since omega is a skew symmetric in the most general case in 2D, we could write it. Um, as you can see here, and then we um, looked at our geometrical relationships that we developed through um, just the geometry, and um, in the first order, so everything we got rid of higher order terms, in the first order approximation, we, um, we found these relationships between the lengths um, I, mean, I shouldn't call it the lengths, between the vectors in the reference configuration and deformed configuration. So um, let me show you the, the, the last thing that we did last time. So in the reference con configuration, everything is like delta x. In the deformed configuration, everything has a prime. So what we did, we related one to the other, and you guys draw this for yourselves and saw that it looks like this. Now we were just about to interpret this to see, so what does this mean? Um, so that's very kind of, we stopped last time and that's exactly <coughs> where we are going to stop this time, a start this time, it's too early to stop. So um, what does this mean here, right? Um, we want to, we are talking about the strain and deformation. And what, how did we define a strain in this class? Do you remember like the strain? How did we define it? No, so the gradient of deformation contains information on a strain, right? Change of length and change of angle. So, um, looking at this, um, what can we say about change of angle? Just looking at this geometry. So let's get us started. So uh, look at um, the, uh, the geometry. So xb to x prime b and xd to x prime d. Both of them are kind of, it's the same, exactly the same um, amount of movement. So what does that tell you? If we started with the right angle here, um, what would be the angle in the red deformed configuration? Yeah, obviously. So I, um, so there is no change of angle. <coughs> In a strain um, um, language, what does that mean? Well, as, uh, going back, a strain could be change of length or angle, right? Um, we called one extension, the other shear. Remember from last time? That means there is no shear. So we all agree with that. How about lengths? So now the second thing is to look to see what happened to these vectors, delta x and delta x prime. Um, what can we say? Well, last time we decided that we show the lengths. Maybe I use a little bit of different color to make things look a little bit better. So this is L prime, right? And this is L. 
and let me call this angle here alpha which I hope everyone agrees that would be the same as this one So Gerald, we just started from where we picked up last time. Um, we are just looking to see what we can say about the state of a strain in, in this figure. So what can we say about lengths? What is going on? L prime and L. L prime I'm sorry? Yeah, L prime is longer, right? Um, it's obviously they cannot be equal. Um, so, okay, so L prime, maybe I write it right like that. L prime is not equal to L, <coughs> but, <laughs> so that's important. Now, Imagine that omega 1, 2, which remember what it is, it's a component in the omega tensor, right? Imagine this is a small, it's pretty small. So if this omega 1, 2 is small, <coughs> do you agree that if it is very small, the Alpha would be equal to the um, ma um, the, amp the uh, magnitude of omega one two, right? The tangent of an angle becomes equal to the angle, and you don't even have to be too small because if you think of the Taylor series expansion, you are basically removing the um, third power. So, so I hope that you all kind of agree that. It's kind of, if it's a small, it's kind of equal. Now, now we can look at the geometry a little bit more carefully. So um, if you look at L and L prime, I guess it's easy to see that L is L prime cosine alpha. And remember in parallel that um, L is nothing else but the change of the, the length of this vector um, in the reference configuration and L prime is in the <coughs> form configuration. And alpha, I can just change it with omega one two, right? I, I assume that it's negative, um, but it doesn't matter for cosine, right? It's, um, it's an even function. So now, if I write the um, Taylor series of cosine, just a few terms of that, around omega one, two, so these are high order terms in omega one, two, obviously. What happens? So what you see is that the difference, it's true that L prime and L are not equal, but their difference is of what order in omega one two? Second order. So if we, if we limit everything to the first order in omega one two, they are equal. Okay, so let me just write this down. So the difference between L and L prime is of second order <coughs> in omega one two. Because that tangent is even in third order, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, so if we limit everything to the first order, they are equal. So I want to write that too. So, um, um, and then when can we say that? We can say that when omega one two is pretty small, right? So let's formalize that. And omega one two is nothing else but a component 
of the gradient of displacement. That's what it is. So I just formalize everything and write it. So if we, if we assume that the gradient of displacement is very small, and I know that we had this discussion, Tom asked me this question last time, that what does it mean that this is a small, right? So it's a small rel relative to the application that you have. And, one, and I thought about it more, and one thing you can think about is, if you d use this theory and you have an experiment, if you see that the results are matching, it means that everything is a small enough, right? So small enough is very, very subjective thing to say. But if it is very uh, small, then, um, then we can say that um, L is equal to L prime. So sometimes we say um, when the gradient is a small, basically the strain has to be inf infinitesimal. So um, that is when each component like omega of one two is very small infinitesimal. I have a tendency to write this word wrong. Um, infinitesimal, then we can say that L is equal to L prime. So in other words, um, the magnitude or the length of the vector hasn't really changed. So if we say that we retain only information which are um, of the first order in displacement gradient, we can say that there is no um, change of length, there is no extension either, right? So retaining um, information that is of the first order in, in displacement gra gradient. We can say that E equal to zero produces no change in angle or length. And this first order in displacement gradient, oh, I, I tried to change the color and I didn't. This is what we call linear. So, so when you when you hear the term linear, it's actually linear in the displacement gradient terms, like omega one two. That's one example. This is just a simple example, two uh, D, right? Um, so what does this tell us? Now I concluded that if e is equal to zero, omega can be whatever. There is no changes in angle or length. So what is actually going on then? Uh, no, no. So we had the translation case last time. For that, both omega and e were zero. So now, in this case, omega is non-zero in general. E is only zero. Now, I showed you that if we limit ourselves to the first order approximation in displacement gradient, then um, there is no change in angular length. So what, what, what is actually going on then? 
movement. Rotation, exactly. You could see it in, in the picture, uh, all of you, when, when you saw it. Um, if I didn't hide the picture, I think you would all say rotation. Um, but not any rotation. That is important. Well, but rotation is by definition rigid body, right? I'm, I'm not trying to discourage you, Prabha, in any ways. <laughs> I'm just trying to, uh, no, don't, don't worry about that. I, someone said something. Like Translation for rotation? Um, no, doesn't, that's not necessarily the case, because omega can still be also zero, right? But, but in this case, but it's let's imagine. you probably mm -hmm. rotating in one axis, one plane, right? Well, I'm not talking about 2D. Now, um, 2D was because I'm not good enough to draw anything better than 2D for you here. Even 2D, you saw that I struggled. So, um, what, 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 what does it tell you? You are trying to think very complicated. <coughs> exactly. Uh, this is what I'm looking for. It's not any rotation. It's very tiny rotation, infinitesimal rotation. So... Um, Let's write that down because this is very important. I go to the next page. So if we have E equal to zero and omega not equal to zero, um, this is an, this describes infinitesimal rigid body, I put the word rigid body for Prabha, body rotation. I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, yeah. So, now, one more time. If in the candidacy exam or it's some other exam, you see something like um, the the Displacement gradient is skew symmetric. That's exactly the same thing that I'm saying here. And instead of saying E is equal to zero, I can say the displacement gradient is skew symmetric, right? Um, can, can you say that this is um, going to be a rigid body rotation right away? When I added right away, you were like, yes, and then no. Right. Yes, you need to um, remember that you are supposing that the uh, displacement gradient is very small. This is important. If you don't make this assumption, you saw for yourself the lengths were not equal. Right? So you cannot say that. And going back to what we described yesterday, you cannot so easily um, um, separate the rigid body from the strain anymore. So if you go to large deformation, everything will be different. Okay? So this is kind of um, the take-home message here, and that's why I go through this trouble. And of course, now we understand what omega does. So this is an infinitesimal rigid body rotation. So now the question, and a more interesting question is, so what is E? So the last case we consider is when E is not zero, right? And omega is zero. So, so the question is, so what does E actually measure? So we consider the last case, and this is an interesting case for us. We, so the gradient is just equal to this time Eij, which implies that um, omega Ij is zero. Because we already know that, you know, that's not very interesting for us. Um, 
So now let's do what um, we did last time. Um, first of all, how does in 2D How does it look like the most general case? <coughs> it's symmetric. Remember, this is always symmetric. So if I have one, two here, here is also one, two. So how about the relationships between um, delta x1 prime and delta x1, so basically what we had last time. So look back in your notes. <coughs> How do you write the relationship? So try to write it um, on your own. At least just for one, not for both, for delta x1. It's a, it's a good thing to do. It keeps you awake and in bed. I write it quietly. I ask you not to look at the board. <laughs> if you can. And some things are zero. So this is zero, right? Um, we are still considering that a square. So the vector delta x1 is parallel to x1. Everything we simplified, right? So they, they, it doesn't have a second component. Um, so this is also zero. And how much is delta x1? One? one? I know that the square is not in front of you. But yeah, it is L. Yeah. So and I want you to accept that if you do the same for the other direction for the other vector basically you are going to get this. So 
So now you can guess what we have to do. We have to do one drawing. So um, to have everything um, um, easy and to have the same things, I again, let's, let's um, for the drawing purposes, for the drawing, um, let's put xA over x prime A. Basically, um, keep one corner at the same location and take the components of the E tensor be positive. So now, um, using this information, let's do what we did last time. I switch the page. So here is our coordinate. So this one is very important because we are going to derive a lot of things from it. So let's make sure that we draw a nice one. Um, here is <coughs> XA and this is XB and I told you that we we assume that we start with a square so make it as a square as you can uh, so this length is L. So is this one. Oh. It's not very beautiful. Um. But if it helps you, this is the vector x1, um, delta x1, and this is the vector delta x2, right? So now, uh, draw the deformed um, confirmation, <coughs> just the two vectors. Just like last time. I didn't do the other corner because <laughs> I don't think it's drawing to <coughs> so we just, um, I wanted to draw the deform, to see, to draw how these vectors will be tied to the deform property. So we are considering the case where E is not equal to omega A. So, we found out the relationships. I'm just asking you to draw it. So those components that we calculated, that's kind of helpful for me to see that if you can connect the rotation to what it is Thank you. 
put at the magnitude, just like what we did before. <coughs> Maybe it would have been helpful if I showed you what we did before. Now I'm regretting not having shown you. Remember this? The red, I'm asking for the red. Right? Um. So what you have are the components of the vectors um, in the deform configuration. So if you look at the uh, first component, it is L plus L E11. So it means that um, I add, maybe I should use some other color here. I add something which, which is L11 here. And if you look at the second one is L times E12. So it means that from this point, I'm going up So my vector, if I assume that xA doesn't really move somewhere, so this would be like x prime A, which is on top of xA. This would be x prime B. I like to show this by a vector. And this is my vector. But the prime doesn't have to go out like that, okay? And with the assumptions, and I assume things to be positive, with the assumptions that I have made, the other one uh, doesn't have place to go, actually. Um, so the other one comes somewhere here. Um, So this is the first component for the other one. And how much it goes up <coughs> is LE22. Sorry about that. I, I should have known not to draw it so close to the edge. OK. So um, before we proceed, let's call this alpha. this beta and this is of course L prime should have used red um, now do we have just one L prime? no not necessarily so this is L prime 1 Because we started with a square, but that doesn't mean that that should be a square afterwards. Okay, I think I'm good. Um, we want to call this angle also three prime. Okay, now we are ready to see what what is going on. And just so you don't forget, this is a case where e is not zero. Omega is. Okay. So let's look at, as we want to look for a strain. So do we have change of angle or not? We have. How much is the change of angle? What do you see here? Exactly. It's alpha plus beta. So if we started with um, an angle phi, so now how do we write alpha and beta? Well, let's look at these triangles. Tangent of alpha, I hope you all can see that it's equal to 
I'm just removing L's cancels out and tangent of beta that's why I needed you to mark the distances basically looks like that now um, if we assume again that everything is linear in displacement gradient so if the displacement gradient um, is very small <coughs> What can we say? Well, displacement gradient, what is in it now? There are just E, I, J, I, D, but we didn't call this a strain rate, right? Not yet. There's this E, I, J. So if it is very small, it means that E11 is much smaller than 1. E22 is much smaller than 1. And Alpha is is just like um, it's tangent. Beta the same. If we put all of this together, we can say that okay, so alpha is becomes under these conditions would be equal to e one two and beta would be also equal to E12. <coughs> In other words, the change of angle which we are interested in alpha plus beta would be just two times E12. Change of angle is related to shear strain. And now we have a relationship. Alpha is E12. Yeah, because look at the tangent. If E11 is much smaller than 1, E, e plus E11 is 1, so the denominator becomes 1. The same, that's why. Sorry that if it wasn't clear enough. So alpha plus beta uh, is just 2 times E12. I know you have seen this before, but I think it's fun to see it this way. Yes? Um, so this is if you are interested in the in a process which, ha which is rate dependent where you have time you're in the wrong class <laughs> it's just um, this is a linear elasticity so what we are going to see in, in about a week um, let's say uh, I think if, if everything goes well there's no, no nothing, no cold day no hot day <laughs> On Tuesday, so not the next Tuesday, the following Tuesday, you are going to see uh, the definition of elasticity. And one of the things that we assume is that we don't care about uh, rate. So um, uh, you, you are thinking about nonlinear elasticity. I think. Do you work with uh, large deformations or something like that? Yeah. So. Um, in one increment, you can assume that um, things are linear, but if you have linear elastic, but if you have time dependence, the whole notion of linear elasticity um, doesn't apply there. So then you have to consider viscoelastic models, right, where, where time dependence is actually being taken into account. So here, um, everything has to be tiny, and, and we can't really, we are not really uh, talking about time. It's everything becomes time independent. Yes? Is this analogous to the usual small distribution? The usual? Yes. The things that you know from before. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. You know things, um, 
maybe not presented in this way, but you, you have used the results of this theory, let's put it this way, without really knowing what assumptions are in play. Is that a fair statement? Yes, of course. If you had not, never seen this before, I would very much worry. Like, it would be really, really bad. So, so what, what we can say here, so look, we have one, two. There is nothing about E11, one, one, E22 two, two here. So from this, I, what we can say is that the components of the uh, displacement gradient where I and J are not equal, uh, they are not the same, so we are not talking about E11, one, one, E22, two, two, E33, three, three. they are they are shear, they, they are related to shear deformation, they are actually shear strength. So, E, so I, I now go from 2D to the general case. Um, EIJ components, <coughs> when I is not equal to J, um, these are many, so I use R. R measures of change in angle and are called um, shear strength. This is what you know. But um, I'm cheating a little bit here, right? The total change in in length is actually double E12, correct? So you may also have heard this before. Engineering shear strain is two times. So we, we use, for the total uh, shear strain, we use gamma. Um, I just use IJ, not in 2D. I mean, it's in, this is um, general. Two times EIJ, this is called Engineering shear strain because it's really the total change of angle, right? And even that you have seen before. Right. Now, this is about um, shear. What else do we have to look into? Change of length. So we need to go back to the drawing that, that you have and see what happened to the lengths. Um, the relationship is um, somewhat not very hard to see, right? L1 prime, like if you look at the projection cosine, then you have a relationship between, between the two. So let's write that down also. Um, I, I, I will lose my um, figure, but I think it's simple enough for you to remember. So now, change in length. Um, why, don't, why don't I let you derive those yourself? So you see the joy of the deriving something after this, and rediscovering what you already need. I know the joy is also something subjective, but <coughs> yeah. let me put up the shape there. So you have the, the geometry up there, so you can see. So you want to relate now L time 1 and L time 2 to L. Just like before, right? What I did before was exactly the same thing.
I don't see as much joy as I was hoping to, to see now. So I hope that you see if you project L prime 1 um, on x1 axis times cosine, it becomes and the same with the other direction. Now since alpha and beta are small, what can we say? The cosines are equal, they become almost one. So, So what you get here is, I write it for E11, this is the joyful part, then you see that E11 becomes what you all already know, but probably you didn't know exactly what went into um, this. So. If you look at EI components, and I have to write here no sum on I, because otherwise it would, would look like I'm um, summing up components. Measure the relative change. In length. So each one of them is looking at one direction, parallel to the i. So if it is one, the first, if it is two, the second, i direction. So now you know why E is a strain tensor, because the components have something to do with change of length and change of angle. So E, the tensor, now it's, it's called um, a smaller strain <coughs> infinitesimal strain or sometimes you hear 
the term linear a strain tensor. Um, I put this in quotation marks because when you talk about linear, it has to you have to be clear it is linear in what. And remember that everything we are considering is to the first order approximation in what? <coughs> displacement gradient. Not displacement. Displacement gradient. So I just add here, so it is if you are if people are talking about linear, if someone told you it is linear say linear in what? And if they didn't know, talk to them about displacement gradient. Um, don't do this in a party or anything like that. <laughs> okay. So now we established what the strain tensor is. Um, let's look at a few <coughs> things um, which are uh, for practical purposes we need them. Like change of volume. Um, I, I'm debating whether to, maybe I start a new page. So now that we know about this, how do we calculate change of volume? Well, for that, of course, we need a 3D. Um, Representation. Mm. I don't attempt to draw the <laughs> deformed configuration, but um, basically, you have some deformation, and this would be a small volume in, in reference configuration. If you deform, uh, after deformation, um, basically delta um, x1 becomes, del the delta x's become delta x prime. But I don't draw it. <laughs> How do I represent the volume? How do we... Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> the, the triple product, right? So if I... I can use any of them, but if I use, if I take two, if I um, use cost product, right, and then multiply it by um, dot product with the other one, we get the volume. After deformation, is this obvious to everyone? Right, but it's uh, this is a scalar product. So um, let's see, two and three. So it, this is negative now. So I have to put this has to be the magnitude because it becomes negative the way I have drawn my um, vector. So I can just change the. It's easier for me to do this. Um, two, 
one. So if I, um, um, this is a scalar product, so the result is just one number. Yeah, this is actually how I have it in mind here. So it's just positive at the end. And of course this was to make sure that everyone is listening, right? So um, in the deformed configuration, basically the, 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 we can use exactly the same trick. Everything just becomes uh, prime. And you already know that we can relate the prime to the uh, reference configuration. This is what we just did in this class in the beginning, or in the middle some, sometime, when we were calculating this delta x prime. And you also know that if you want to calculate this kind of triple product, um, you can very easily do that. So without showing you how to do it, Oh yes, that's true. Where is my EI? I put the EI, mm, no, it wouldn't look good, so let's just put it. Um, thank you. So now if we, if we do the calculations, um, we can see that V prime If I start with a cubic element of length of si every side uh, b of length l, um, we see that after deformation, it becomes the volume becomes like that. I draw a small cube here, length l. There are some higher order terms, and now you know the drill. In, in elasticity, in linear elasticity that we consider in this class, um, we have to just say, well, we ignore them. If you have large deformation, of course, this is not the case. So there, this would be V, right? That, that is in the um, reference configuration. If we start with a cube like that, so the relative change in volume <coughs> then it becomes just EII which is nothing else but the trace of the tensor. But remember, even that is only valid when everything is so small in, in displacement gradient. Everything in first order in displacement gradient. The next important thing to, um, to talk about is spherical and deviatoric strains. So, you have seen this also before. I use the same notation as in the book. So we can write the strain tensor 
as a summation of two, two parts. One part looking like this, one third E K K delta, delta I J. And the other part, so one with tilde, the other with hat, would be just the tensor minus yep. um, How does this um, <coughs> component with the tilde, does, how does it look like? What kind of tensor is it? Can you see it in the tensor notation? Yeah, so, so it's, just, um, it's just one value multiplied by identity tensor. I want to see it in tensor notation, um, how it looks like. So this is called a spherical or as um, Kingsley said, hydrostatic It's because it re re resembles the state of um, strain inside a fluid in equilibrium. So that's where the name comes from. And the other part um, is called deviatory. One thing I forgot to mention um, is that the change in volume, the relative change in volume is called dilatation. So I go back and write that there because that's important. I've heard it being pronounced dilatation too. So which which one does it sound more familiar to you? Dilatation or dilatation? 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 Okay. I go with my... Yeah, we have to let native speakers <coughs> decide. Um, but just uh, uh, take a vote, so how many say? <laughs> I guess a lot of things are regional, or it depends on whatever. But um, so now a question I have for you is, what is the dilatation? Is that what um, everyone, as long as you understand what it is, that's fine with me, of E, uh, e tilde, what, what would be the dilatation of E Okay, talk to each other. I know it's kind of really late, but what is the dilatation of? Do you know what the dilatation of E tilde would be? <coughs> no? So um, then I asked you to visualize it. It looked like it, it was, so this is a diagonal matrix. So every density is like an identity matrix multiplied by one pair. It could be just EII or EKK, doesn't matter what we use, EJJ, whatever. Um, so, 
So the, the point is that the dilatation of E tilde is the same as the dilatation of E. And it is a still EII. And what does it tell us about the dilatation of E hat? Zero. Yes. <laughs> and what does dilatation measure? Change in volume. So with doing that, we are um, looking at a strain tensor which is related to the change of volume and the other one which um, has nothing to do with change of volume. So one of them uh, has change of volume in it, the other one doesn't have. So that's kind of the point here. Let me make sure. I'm say. One other thing to say just very um, quickly is a strain transformation. So if we If we change the, um, if you rotate the coordinate system, change or rotate the coordinate system, do you remember how, for a tensor, how you would go from one coordinate system to the other? What did we use? Use. Could you fill this up? How many cues do I need here? Because, exactly, because this is a second order tensor. So, and the cues are what? Exactly. And what are these cues? Exactly. So, If I take ij, that's like the cosine of i prime and j. The angle. So this has we have been defined uh, have defined this in the mathematical preliminaries before. This is just a quick quick call. You're doing great. So now the very last thing. So if you haven't looked at the book, we are close to the end of chapter two. Um, chapter one took longer, but two, three, four are going to go um, fast because they're they're more familiar to us. So um, the next thing, or the last thing that I want to um, talk to you about is what is called the strain compatibility equation, and this is um, this is the answer to this question. Let, let's, let me write the question first and then I explain. Let's AIJ XK be a symmetric tensor field. say that this is a strain field? We know that the strain field is a symmetric second order ten tensor field. This is a second order, yeah, I have ij, it's symmetric. Can we say that this is a tensor field, uh, a strain field? So let me, um, let me make sure it's, I know, late in the afternoon. So we know that a strain tensor is a symmetric second order tensor field. This we know, right? Now, I'm asking the question this way. If someone is giving me a tensor field which is symmetric and second order, can I say that this is a strain 
tensor. So I guess it's, it's like a question like that. If all the students are wearing blue, can we say that everyone who is wearing the blue is a student? No. So the logic says no. But we want to know um, under what conditions, if you are given a tensor, you, this tensor would be a string uh, tensor. So that's the question. So in general, I guess we all agree that um, not everyone who wears blue is a student, right? Um, in general, AIJ is not a strain field. So the question is, I, I wrote two questions. So what are the the conditions A I J should satisfy to be a, a strain tensor field. And to answer this question, we need to look at something that you guys yourselves actually wrote down so we have this is the definition of the strain tensor it's just a symmetric part of the displacement gradient right. so how can we say that this is a strain uh, uh, no uh, what what would be the defining property of this uh, strain tensor? So the question goes back to under which circumstances, if we have a tensor, it corresponds with a continuous single value um, displacement field. So this is kind of the question we are asking. And the condition is kind of similar to what you have seen before in a very different problem. Um, if you have a force, if, you, if someone asks you, you have a force, how do you know that force is conservative? How did you answer this question before? That's the definition of being conservative, right? It means that um, if you want to calculate the work done by that force, it doesn't matter which path you take. The, the work will be independent of the, of, of the path. But how did you know that a, a force field was conservative? Was it anything being downloaded right now? The force field is path independent. Yes, that's the definition, but how did you know that? It has to do with Carol. Do you remember anything about that? <laughs> but that's the definition. Yeah, that's kind of the definition of, and these two problems are very related to each other. So when you have a force field, um, if you wanted to know that this is conservative, um, I think you have seen it. Yes, you see, it's something is coming back to you. So, um, because why it is like that? When it is conservative, what can you associate to this force field? It's very light, I know. Oh, we are out of time, but, but let's finish this because it's very... 
بیاین نمی دادم Do you remember something about the potential um, energy? So if it is conservative, <coughs> the force is the gradient of the potential thing, right? Yeah. So um, there is very same kind of concept is here. I, um, this is the last thing from chapter two. I stop here because um, the equations will take time to write. It's compatibility, a strain compatibility. But before you go, expect to have a class exercise 